welcome to Compound Ideas. Hosted by Ken Majmudar of Ridgewood Investments, this podcast will feature exceptional individuals to uncover deep insights into business, entrepreneurship, personal growth, investing, and multidisciplinary thinking so that you can learn how to improve your finances, find better investments, and pursue authentic lifelong growth, wisdom, and happiness. Learn more and stay up to date at CompoundIdeaShow.com. In this episode, I speak to Sam Namiri, co-founder and co-portfolio manager of the Ridgewood Select Value Fund, a focused fund that concentrates on investing in publicly traded small and micro cap companies. In our wide ranging conversation, Sam and I talk about his upbringing as a Persian growing up in the Los Angeles area, his experiences starting and running a successful business while still in college, and his journey to becoming an investor focusing on small and micro cap businesses, and how these experiences shaped and continue to shape his approach to investing today. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Thank you very much, Sam, for being here. Hey, Ken. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Sam, let's just start out. I'd love to hear a little bit about your background, like how you grew up, where you grew up, just to set the stage. Sure. Let's go back all the way to early times. So I'm a son of immigrants. My parents came to the U.S. from Iran in their early 20s. They were both and went to U.S. My dad went to USC and my mom also joined him there. From there, right after my parents graduated, they had me. I was born in LA, grew up in Santa Monica, went to public school throughout and ended up going to UC Berkeley afterwards. And so that's kind of my background in terms of where I'm from. My dad is an architect slash developer. So that's shaped me quite a bit as well, like learning from him. And he also manages and owns real estate in combination. So he kind of is vertically integrated, I like to say, when it comes to real estate. And my mom was an accountant slash bookkeeper part-time um, and raised both me and my sister growing up. So that's kind of my background. Yeah, great. Well, our show is about ideas and about sort of multidisciplinary thinking. And I personally believe that everybody's exceptional in some way, if you could just sort of get the stories of their life arc out of them. And that's sort of what, a lot of what we're going to try to do, not only today, but with all of our guests. So I'd love to hear, I mean, just probe me a little bit more what you said. I mean, obviously, Los Angeles is one of the great cities in the world. What was it like being an immigrant sort of growing up in Los Angeles? And I don't know if you mentioned this, but you're Persian, right? So I know that there was a whole lot of people that probably in or around the same time frame left Iran. I guess that was sort of late 70s, early 80s. What was it like both being in LA and Santa Monica in particular in growing up in that milieu, but also being in the Persian community growing up in LA? So a lot of Iranians left after the revolution or during it in 1979. So there was a huge migration just anywhere outside of Iran, especially if you were not Muslim, then you for sure were trying to get out. And so fortunately, my parents left a little earlier because again, my dad got accepted to USC and he left then and his brother had left earlier before that. So that's kind of how they were able to get out. I have stories from aunts and uncles, though, who had a much, much tougher time getting out. They had to cross borders by land and get flights from other cities. That's a whole interesting conversation on its own. In terms of LA, LA is kind of dubbed as Irangelis or Terangelis is the capital of Iran. So there definitely is a huge Persian community out here. I believe some estimates I looked at recently was around a million Iranians or uh, don't quote me on that, but a, a good amount. And so growing up, I'd say probably until sixth or seventh grade, it didn't really hit me as to like what I was in terms of culture and religion. Like I just considered myself American and I spoke another language at home. But other than that, like there wasn't really many Iranian families or other students in my elementary school. If there was, I just, we all blended in together with the rest of them. We didn't have funny accents. We all grew up speaking English. It was more just like the foods we ate at home were a little bit different. And then I'd say once we, I got into middle school, I don't know if it was natural or what it was, but a lot of the Persians and Iranians, I became very close friends with a group of other ones. And a big group of my close friends were Persian and Iranian. And so there was a big community outside of that that I had of family friends that were pretty much all Persian. But I don't know how much it truly shaped me. There was a few incidences I had as a child that were racial based, like where people would 
call you funny names or, you know, I remember my dad would get into like arguments with people like at a tennis court one time where someone was rollerblading on a tennis court and, you know, he, he gave like a racial slur. He called my dad like a camel jockey or something of that sort. And so outside of that, and then kids always play games with each other, but I, I didn't really have too many issues. 9-11 in terms of any racial bias, like didn't, did, I didn't really feel like it affected me very much. I think I was still too young. I pretty much grew up, I feel like an American. I don't think it really shaped me too much in terms of how I think or how I was treated. I think the biggest thing for me, my religion, I'd say probably shaped me to some degree. I'm Zoroastrian, which is an extremely rare religion. It's the f- oldest monotheistic religion that exists, that still exists. And there's three tenets there, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. And that's pretty much like what you're supposed to live by. And I think that's a great thing to live by. And I think that shaped me a lot in terms of just having good morals. I think that's very important. I'd say that probably shaped me more than anything. That's really interesting. Yeah, a lot of people don't know about Zoroastrianism. I happened to, when I was really young, take a sort of a survey of religion classes, I think, in high school. And that was the first time I ever heard of it. So that's really fascinating. How did Los Angeles shape you growing up in Los Angeles specifically then? And the other thing I'd love for you to just touch on that many of our listeners may not know. So I think the Persians overall, even though they're immigrants, became quite successful. So I'm curious if you have any observations on sort of how and why that happened. I think a lot of it is education is extremely important, the Persians. And I think they have the most like per capita, I think highest PhD percentage in the US is Iranian Americans. And so I think that's one aspect of it. Like a lot of the founders of companies like eBay, Piero Midyar, he's Persian. There's a lot of technical education that's, that's very focused in the Iranian community. I think that's one of the, the main things. The other thing is I think entrepreneurial spirit. I think that's big with a lot of Persians. They don't want someone else kind of telling them what to do. <laughs> They're controlling them. And so I think that's one aspect that I'm not sure if it holds as much in the current generation, but in the, in the older generation, let's say my parents, that was like a big thing. I think it, a lot of it was shaped due to the government that where they came from. And the reason why they fled through the revolution was because gov- the government was like going to tell them exactly how to run their lives. So I think that's a big aspect of it. In terms of Los Angeles shaping me, I'd say, I mean, it's a big city, so there's different parts of the city. And I think for me, the biggest thing was there's two aspects. The first thing was the fact that I went to public school. And at public school, there's a huge wide range of people from different economic backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, and such. And so I think for me, it allows me to pretty much be able to talk and get along with most people from most backgrounds, whether someone who's low income, I can talk to a lot of different people. I played basketball a lot too. And with playing basketball, again, like you kind of share that similar language where you can kind of, again, like, and I was a big team leader. Like I was all about getting everyone together and making the most out of the team. And I think that shaped me quite a bit as well too. Cause again, I can just, especially when I get on the basketball court with other people, it allows me to talk to them in a way where we can all feel comfortable and we can kind of build a trust and rapport like pretty easily and quickly. I think that's probably the biggest thing that shaped me. And then also living in a big city like LA, you don't really do a lot of the things that kids do because they're bored a lot, like by getting in trouble and doing, you know, things of that sort. I think that somewhat shaped me as well too. Because when I went to college, there were kids who came from small towns and they were just constantly doing things that were just like at the borderline of getting in trouble. And I never really had that urge to really do that. So I think I was just too busy. There's too many things going on. There's always something to do, somewhere to go that I never really fell victim to that. So, And then fast forward, I guess, to college. What was the college experience like? I think you mentioned you went to Berkeley, which is obviously a, a great school. And what were the highlights in terms of how that shaped your experience and your next stage of your life that we're going to get to? On the education side, I'd say... I never really needed to study much prior to college. It was quite a shock when I went to my first class, like multivariable calculus class, for instance, at Berkeley, more physics. And everyone studied very, very hard for every single test. In high school, that wasn't the case. So it really forced me to like really truly hunker down and really need to study and truly master something because everyone's going to get over 90% on every single test on most of the tests there. 
but really it's everything was on a curve. So the way to get an A was how do you get that one or two, one of those one or two questions right that everyone else gets wrong. And you really had to know everything down to a T. And so that was the first time I really had to do that. I didn't need to do that prior to that. So that shaped me quite a bit. And also I'd say the other thing that shaped me was really at Berkeley, I think it's different at private schools is they really throw you out there and you're, you're out there fending on your own. A lot of people fail. I think 10% of the freshman incoming class don't get past their first year. And so a lot of private schools, they kind of hold your hands as you're going through if you're struggling and at Berkeley, they don't. So that was also like very, it helped shape me a lot in terms of having to figure things out on my own and get through things on my own. And also I say on my own, but I, I figured out how to get support as well, too. I started to go to tutoring. I started going office hours and talk to professors. These are things I probably never thought I would do going in. And so I think that shaped me quite a bit in terms of education. And then socially, just going to a big school like that. Again, I come from one city, one small section of the world, and it just opened the door up to people from Chicago, people from Northern California. Wow, what a big difference between SoCal and NorCal. I and mean, you just don't realize it while you're living in this bubble called so in, in Southern California. And so that shaped me quite a bit as well, too, like living in the dorms. And also I was in a fraternity as well. Again, all walks of life, different races, backgrounds, areas of the country where they're from. That was quite an experience. What's the difference between Southern and Northern California since you mentioned it? I mean, Southern California is a lot more about looks a lot more aware in terms of that. I'd say like a little more Hollywood. There's some language differences. I remember a lot of Northern California people say like hella or hecka a lot. That was one big difference I found. And wow, you're trying to go back 20 years. Those were probably the two bigger things that I realized, like style of music, like even when it comes to like, I'm a big rap and hip hop guy and the local music that comes out of each area is very different in style as well too. Nice. So you're graduating now. What did you major in? I majored in industrial engineering and operations research. So the story behind that was that I went in undecided and I was trying to figure out what to do. And I've always been fascinated by business and I took intro to business and it just, to be honest, it seemed too easy. It seemed like kind of like a waste, like this is kind of common sense stuff. And I had some friends who were engineers and they were studying, one was studying bioengineering, another one mechanical engineering. They're like, you should look at engineering. This is a, it's a great major. And they're actually, both their families came from the Los Alamos National Lab. So they were very into the hard sciences. I was looking through the pamphlet they had on engineering and I was going through the different ones and industrial engineering and operations research was one of the majors. And I said, oh, a lot of Fortune 500 top executives study operations research or have a degree in operations research. My dream as a kid, after I realized I wasn't going to be the Lakers team doctor, was to you know one day ideally be CEO of a big company. And so when I read that in the pamphlet, I was like, oh, this is perfect fit for me. So I decided to do that and it was a great experience. It really added a technical element to business and operations that I thought was missing from the traditional business major. I went to engineering school too, and IEOR was quite a popular major there as well. So what did you decide? What were you looking at doing after graduating? What did you think you wanted to do? I actually started a business in the summer after my junior year going to my senior year. I wasn't really going through the traditional job route, um, looking at job hunting. I did a little bit of that but not much. My heart wasn't really in it. And I was really focused on growing this business, which yeah, fortunately for me, ended up really taking off as soon as I graduated. I actually had another job at an engineering firm that I had started right after graduating. And there I was, they kind of created a new role for me. It was kind of like a liaison between uh, the engineer because it was mostly electrical and mechanical engineers. And they created like, it was more like a business development position where I would go and kind of bridge the gap between the client and the engineers on the team. But my business that I had, my jewelry company that I'd started, took off like the first month that I was working at the engineering firm. And I ended up making more money that month than I would have working the whole year as an engineer. So I, you know, gave my notice pretty quickly after I started that job. Like any good person, you would just jump right into business, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so tell us about that business and how'd you get the idea and how did you end up sort of starting that while you were still in the summer between your junior and senior year of college. Yeah, so I had a friend there who um, we started the business together and he was telling me that people would bring gemstones over from Pakistan and they would sell it in the US and it would pay for their whole vacation in the US. So I was like, well, it seems interesting. Started doing some research into it and learned about 
the gem business, the jewelry business. And I realized, wow, there's like huge margins and there's so many different middlemen from the mine all the way to the end retail. And so I was like, hey, let's scale that business. Let's do what these guys were doing to pay for their vacations and growing it even bigger. So I started doing that, made some mistakes, um, went to some trade shows, learned more about it and really just like kept trying a bunch of different things until something stuck. And ironically, the first thing that truly stuck was we would just buy some wholesale silver rings and sell them retail on eBay and started doing that. And the first Christmas or holiday season made a killing that year. And so that's kind of how it really started. Well, what year would that have been then? And get into the specifics because I think it's really interesting. That was in 2005. Yeah, the winter of 2005. I graduated in May and I was doing the business. And then it was around like September, October. And I was like, okay, you know what? This isn't enough for a living at the time. And I need to get a job. <laughs> so that, that's when I ended up work, getting, starting working at that engineering firm. And I'd say in October, we started selling silver jewelry and started selling really, really well. So I want to say like in that month, I think we had the month of November, we had around like three, 250, 300,000 in sales. It was crazy. I still remember um, I was working out of my parents, they had like an extra room, my parents' house. And we had jewelry on every single cabinet on this bookshelf that they had. And we were buying more bookshelves all the time. We were selling so much, we couldn't even get the supply for it. I was running around downtown LA in the jewelry district, just trying to find silver jewelry that looked similar to the stuff that we were selling on eBay that we were pre-selling in advance of actually holding inventory. And so that really was really a true test of operations, figuring out how to ship things efficiently in massive scale. And I say it was like $300,000 worth. Our average price point was 10 to $15. And that includes shipping. So we were really selling a lot of quantity and moving a lot of quantity out. So That's almost like lightning striking, right? Like if you're a young entrepreneur, you stumble onto something and suddenly you get just like a bunch of orders. Obviously it's hard to deal with, but it's also kind of what you hope for. So walk us through sort of what happened to that business, where it evolved, what you learned from that experience that might be helpful to others who may be in a business or thinking about it. Sure. So, I mean, that was the first year, ran that business for around five years or so. And it evolved into opening a factory overseas. At one point, we had a factory in Pakistan that had 250 or so employees at one point. And then we ended up contract manufacturing out of China. And then also we developed and built a television show as well, too. That was uh, at one point on DirecTV. But we also used something called Least Access, which is really interesting, that got us really, really cheap airtime at a lot of different markets, mostly in the middle of the night. And then I'd say... What happened was after the financial crisis, there was a ton of people selling online. At the end of the day, eBay was always our bread and butter, even though we had a TV show. That was very hit or miss. And you really need a lot of scale to actually be efficient and profitable with a TV show because the production costs end up being so high and the transmission costs end up being so high unless you have like a satellite transmission. And it doesn't really make sense. Like we were sending tapes to like different markets. But once the financial crisis hit, there were a lot of fake jewelry sellers really that were selling silver jewelry online, especially on eBay and you can't compete with fake. And so that was really one of the problems of that business that made it tough. And then also I got into business school and when I went to business school, I realized I never really loved jewelry. It wasn't a passion of mine. I wasn't really out there like trying to figure out, oh, what do people want? Like what's exciting for people? I was more like data mining and figuring out like okay, trying something out, something sold, great, let's go sell more of it. We can raise the price. Let's raise the price. Oh, we can't sell this anymore. Let's, let's stop selling it. That was kind of what, I mean, I'm colorblind. So when it comes to jewelry, like I don't know what stones are, are what, what color they are. So again, just not a passion of mine. And then when I went to business school, I realized Columbia had a value investing program and I learned more about value investing. And I was like, wow, this just really, if I could do this for a living, I would love to do this for the rest of my life. And so that's kind of what happened. Ended up yeah, going to business school and going that route. So did you go to business school while the business was still around or the business ended and then you decided, let me apply and go to business school? The business was still around and I applied and I got in. And then after I got in, I was like, okay, it's time to either wind down the business or sell it. Couldn't really sell it because it was way too driven by constantly like finding good deals. That was really the biggest value add that we had. 
And yeah, I think that's kind of it. And I'd say one thing I really learned from that business is that when you run a business in a way, it's like the jewelry business is a very bad business to invest in, for instance. It's very fragmented, it's very competitive, no barriers to entry, just very, very difficult. Like it's really a race to the bottom to some degree, unless you have a brand. And a brand is very, very difficult and expensive to build. We never had a brand. So I, I think I really learned that it's really difficult to run a bad business, no matter how good you are. And there's things out of your control. Like everything, there's things out of your control. But like now when I look at businesses, when I see characteristics of other businesses that have that that same characteristics of the jewelry business that I had, I was like, I kind of tend to shy away from it. I'd say the biggest thing I learned was that don't be involved in a bad business if you don't need to be. So then fast forward, now you're at Columbia Business School. What was that experience like? What were your big takeaways there? I'd say Columbia was definitely very different academically than Berkeley. A lot more handholding if someone was struggling, it helped you out quite a bit. The admin, the staff, the teachers. For me, it was pretty easy relatively to Berkeley, again, academically. What ended up being more challenging for me is I didn't come from a finance background and Columbia is a very finance heavy school. And so I learned like how to build financial models while well, most other kids in that school knew already how to do that coming from private equity or investment banking or consulting to some degree. So for me, it was that aspect of it was really good. I got to learn from some of the best professors when it comes to value investing, like people who were actually like running funds, running big amounts of money, things of that sort. And then I had like a great group of classmates as well too. Like my network from Columbia is amazing. Some of the things that people have done or where they came from was just like spectacular. I'd probably say that's the biggest value I got from business school was a combination of network. And for me also figuring out a structured way to understand value. I'd say those were the two big takeaways that I had there. Okay. So now you're obviously graduating with your MBA and you have probably many different ways you can go. How did you think about what to do next? In all honesty, like for me, I always had this like stigma attached or whenever I applied to a job at a large company, they were generally like, well, you had your own business. Like, why would you want to go work for somebody else? And so that usually kind of, again, most people I talk to would always kind of give me that kind of excuse. And I also was in the J term. So I didn't go through the traditional route of a business school where you have a summer internship. And so for me, I had school in the summer. And so again, I couldn't go through a traditional internship program. So I ended up looking for internships while I was in school and I had a few options. This was the next January afterwards, or sorry, the fall after my first summer. And I ended up talking to some people and every person I talked to was like, Hey, do you know anyone in New York who's looking for an intern, New York area, looking for an intern? I want to work just for the smartest person that I could find. And so I ended up having a few options and I was looking at a few different hedge funds actually. And one of them was a retail focused hedge fund. Unfortunately, the guy just got back to me two weeks late, (laughs) but I ended up working at a a fund across the river in New Jersey, small cap value-based fund. And I ended up interning there and then I ended up going full-time after school. So that's kind of how it started for me in the investment management world. So tell us what your role was there, what that experience was like, what you learned from it. It was really great because I would learn stuff in class, but you don't truly learn things until you actually do it and you do it multiple times. So for instance, if I'm writing up a a report on an investment for a class, I'm maybe doing like two or three a semester or depending on the class, just not that many. But now at the fund, I'm doing a lot more and I'm building out models and I just have a lot more time just to focus on just researching and just doing that, that type of work. It really made me a lot better at being able to do it more quickly because of the practice and the iteration. So in combination, like at business school, a lot of the times, like a lot of these other students knew how to do all these things and I didn't. So I was learning how to do it while they were just like whipping out all these projects and papers. And it really comes down to like an investment banking training program. Like they went through that the first like year or two years in investment banking. These guys were learning how to use Excel without a mouse and a keyboard, just just using the keyboard and all the shortcuts. And so you just see them going super fast at it. And I kind of started to get that a little bit while I was in business school. I would say I kind of lost it to some degree. Like I don't necessarily do it as quickly or need to do it as quickly as I used to. With experience, you start learning. You don't need to like make sure your model fully links everything together. You can start putting estimates in certain parts of it. But yeah, I mean, I'd say that first year working at the hedge fund, I learned so much. And then once I got past that learning curve, 
you don't learn as much after that going forward. But yeah, I really like learned from just being in the office, chatting with, there was two other members of the team, chatting with them all the time. We'd be on a lot of conference calls together. So just like learning from questions that were asked, what are good questions? What questions do I not like? I'd say the one thing I really learned was how to get people to feel comfortable on a phone call, you know, before even seeing them in person, because really that opens people up a lot more. So when you ask questions, they end up being more truthful and more honest. So that was one thing that I thought was on the soft skills was very, very valuable for me to learn that. So just for the benefit of our listeners, tell us what that technique is. So really just trying to find some sort of common ground, whether it's someone you know, an industry you know, company you know, kids, whatever it is, like just have someone talk about themselves. And when they talk about themselves, most people like to talk about themselves. And so just start off there. That really helps a lot. If you don't do that and you start just like grilling management as soon as you pick up the phone and talk to them, that doesn't really create that sense of openness. You want to make them want to help you in a way. And so that's something that I don't always do, but I, but I try to be you know conscious of and to do if possible. So, and by the way, you've always focused, or I mean, you did there and then you still do today, focus on sort of smaller companies. So talk about why that happened. Was it just an accident because you ended up at a fund that focused there or is there more to it than that? I really started investing and getting the stocks during the dot-com bubble. This was like during dial-up internet days. And there, me and my friend, Crystal Hiji would always just like be interested in these stocks. We'd always go to Yahoo Finance during school, at lunch breaks, you know, recess. And we'd always be interested in like learning about the next new story. What's the next new technology out there that we can invest in? That's really where it started for me, the passion. And I've always kind of been doing it on the side for myself. And my dad also kind of pushed me towards it to some degree as well, too. Like he never really wanted me to get into real estate. He didn't like certain aspects of it, like the lack of liquidity. And he didn't really ever see too much value in it, to be honest. He, he always thought that the cash flow, the risk reward, like wasn't usually that great on pricing when it came to certain deals that he was being offered. And so he always ended up saying, hey, I have to build something to get that reward. And so, yeah, he kind of was like, hey, you know, let's see if you're interested in this and let's see if it's something you want to do. But I don't think he ever realized that there's actually funds out there that like do this for a living. He was more doing it as like a side hobby for me. And so he gave me some money to invest when I was young, when I was in high school, I remember he gave me like a thousand dollars or so and I invested it for him and I did pretty well with it. And one of the things that really struck me into why I wanted to go into value investing at business school was I would invest in, for instance, GM and GM would come out with earnings and they'd beat earnings and the stock would go down. And I'd be like, why does it make any sense? Like, why is the stock going down? And I really wanted to learn why, and I couldn't figure it out why. And so I was like, okay, maybe I can go to business school and understand truly how to value a company. And maybe that'll help me understand why GM went down in that instance. And so I remember that was very, that really stuck with me quite a bit when I, when I invested in GM and they beat and the stock goes down the ne- that day, the next day. So I think it's actually interesting because I didn't realize that because I think a lot of people, like especially in Los Angeles, they've made a lot of money in real estate just over time. Los Angeles real estate has done really, really well. People were pretty much moving to Los Angeles for decades and decades. I don't know if maybe recently that might have started to reverse or at least flatten out. But also I thought a lot of people in the Persian community, including people like your dad, I thought they really believe in sort of hard assets and not things like stocks and company investing. So I didn't really realize that your dad had been the one that sort of was a catalyst for that. I think it was, it's changed for him also to some degree. I think he still doesn't understand stocks very well. And so he kind of still sees it to some degree as funny money. But at that time, I remember him telling me, he's like, I could have invested in Qualcomm and it went up hundred X and I didn't, or he sold it early. I can't remember what it was exactly. And I think like the emotions from that is kind of what pushed him to like, say, Hey, let's try this out. See if it's something you want to learn or I mean, he didn't expressly even say that. He was just like, hey, here's some money. Go play with some stocks. <laughs> That's really what it was for him. And for him, I guess it was just funny money. And so like, he didn't know what he was doing. So he was like, okay, might as well just give it to you. <laughs> Let you see if you can figure out what you're doing. And so again, it was just interesting to me. And I've always loved the study of business. In college, that's what I wanted to do is I wanted to, to learn about business and how to run a business and be in the trenches of a business. I'd say after running a business, the other thing that how it shaped me is managing people is tough, very, very tough. And, you know, dealing with scheduling with people being sick, their personal lives, things of that sort was something that 
it was really, really difficult dealing with when I was running the business, the jewelry company. And I occasionally get the itch to like, maybe we should, I should start this business doing this or that. And I go back to thinking about, you know, the day in day out struggle of just doing these simple tasks of managing people. And I'm like, you know, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. And so that's why investment management, in my opinion, is such an amazing business because it can scale quite easily. And, you know, it's a lot of fun because you're always learning about new things. Now, did your dad ever change his view on sort of real estate versus stocks or? I think it goes back and forth. I think the main thing that hasn't changed is my dad's a big cash flow guy. And so he never kind of gives credit to like rising rents and he doesn't really give credit. He doesn't really like expect someone else to come in and buy something at a higher price because my dad's a buy and hold kind of guy. He never wants to sell. And California also has some characteristics in terms of property taxes that kind of incentivize that as well too. But yeah, I think that's the biggest thing for him. He's always like, okay, well, if I want to buy something, well, how much can I rent it out for? What are the rents that are coming in? And I don't want to pay too high of a, sorry, I always mix up EBITDA multiples and cap rates. I don't want to pay too low of a cap rate. And that, that I think shaped me quite a bit too, when it comes to like investing in equities, because I'm similar in that way. Yeah. Just for those that may not know. So the reference to with the California tax thing. So I believe, and you could correct me if this is accurate or not, is that California has sort of a unusual system in that they don't actually change your assessment essentially until you sell it and you move. So that way, then that marks it to market. So obviously if you just stay and you never leave, at least on the residential side, your assessment can stay as low as it was when you first bought the house. Yeah, it's for everything, not just residential, commercial. It can rise, I believe, by 2% annually a year, the basis that your property tax is based off of. Like for instance, my parents bought their house in 1987 and they bought it for $300,000. And so I think the property tax value from then is like, maybe they're paying like as if it's worth like $500,000. And now the value of their house is worth like over 5 million or so, at least. That's very unusual because in a lot of states, it's just every 10 years or whatever number of years, they reassess everything. Yeah. So I don't know what it's like, but do people move because of that? I assume so, because the reassessment brings up the property tax and maybe they don't, can't afford it or don't want to pay it. I'd say in California, you'll see a lot of businesses, for instance, that own their buildings and the buildings are completely run down. And you also question, like, would the business even survive if they didn't own the real estate? They might as well just rent it out to somebody else. They probably get better value out of it than running their business. But anyway, yeah, it's an odd thing. They've actually been trying to change it a few times. There have been some props that have been passed or have been up to being passed and have been shot down. More on the commercial side, that's a little easier, I think, for voters to stomach. But yeah, I mean, it's hard. Like, it's definitely a different world when it comes to buy and hold in California because of that. Completely different system. And actually, I mean, I guess, you know, it has pros and cons depending on where on the spectrum you are, who you are. Great for the owners that have owned stuff for a long time. But on the flip side, I do believe that in some aspects, it makes it hard to finance education in California, at least in some districts and things because of the tax revenue that comes in. But switching gears now, you're at this hedge fund, obviously, you're working with a smaller team, and you were there from what year to what year, and then sort of let's bring it to the next thing after that? Sure. I was there from 2012 to 2017, I believe. So the fund I was at, I think it was 2014, we were up around like 60 or so percent. And I was like, great, this is amazing. I think we were managing around 30 million or so at the time. And for me as the number three person there, it didn't really make sense to stay there unless we were able to grow, let's say to at least 60 to 70 million, at least 50, we had to cross $50 million mark. And so for me, after that year, I thought we were going to be able to raise a lot of money and we weren't like, we didn't really raise much. We probably raised two or 3 million at that point. And so there, I kind of saw the writing on the wall that at some point I need to start figuring out something else to do because long-term, this isn't the right situation for me. So I think that's when this is probably 2016, I started to think about what I wanted to do next. And I was interviewing at a few different funds, didn't really ever, it was never a good investment fit. And that was more because I never truly felt like I was actually able to get an edge or to provide like real value. I kind of felt that with a lot of different strategies that they were doing, you might as well just invest in an ETF or in some index fund or some mutual fund and kind of get value. You get most of the value that way. And it was just really hard to beat the market, but I could see that it was much, much easier in smaller micro cap land. And so 
that's why my passion is there. Cause I was like, Hey, this is where I can really add a lot of value. And so I ended up partnering with you. <laughs> I was going to go on my own route and launch a fund myself. And then we met and I think we both kind of connected that we both see a ton of value in the space and by investing in the space and that we've both been good at it, doing it ourselves. And for me at the fund I was at, and so it made sense to kind of partner with you and do it together. For those who aren't spending all their time like you are in this small and micro cap, you mentioned it sort of, hey, you know, you had potential to talk to an interview with big firms and they're probably focusing on larger companies and you didn't feel that you or they might really have had an edge, but you do feel that there is sort of, it's better or easier in small and micro. So talk about that. Why is that? And where does that opportunity come from? I think really the opportunity comes from, it's not as followed, not as well followed in the space. Like you'll see things where like a news will come out about another company, for instance, it's a huge customer of a micro cap company. And you would expect that that would move the stock quite a bit, for instance, but it doesn't. <laughs> and, and you have to wait until the quarter comes out to reflect the results to show that the company you know, had a, is doing really well because their customer made a big order from them. So like that's an example. Another one is most people who invest in micro caps, most investors, they're more like gambling with their money, I'd say. And so I think emotions and a lot of the behavioral biases that happen in large caps, they, they happen to a lot more extremes in small and micro caps. So if a micro cap company has a bad quarter, it usually drops a lot more than a large cap company if they have a bad quarter. And it just goes to a more extreme, um, which again, I think allows, creates a lot more opportunity where if you actually see the value in the company and you're more longer term focused, you can kind of get past that. So there's a lot of, like a lot of other things, like a lot of these large cap companies, there's like 15 or 20 firms that do like intense research on them, small micro caps. You'll be lucky to find like two or three depending on how big it is or how much M&A the company does. So that's another example. And yeah, I mean, I think just even the firms that do the research, they don't have the resources and they don't spend the resources to go visit companies in person to see, see their actual facilities or to meet people below upper management. I have friends who are analysts at these small cap banks and they just don't do it. They're like, we don't have the research budget. I'd love to, but we're not a revenue driver of our firm. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that's really what it comes down to is that there's not much money to be made in terms of total dollars in small and micro cap, whether you're a service provider, even as a fund, if you want to be the best business you can be, it doesn't make sense to run a small and micro cap fund. You want to be able to manage 10, 20, $30 billion and make fees off of that. And so as a small micro cap fund, only managing maximum few hundred million dollars, let's say you've kind of put a cap on your limit. And so I think that's another reason why there's advantages. And, and the other thing that's great is we can talk to management teams. We can call the CEO of a company and they'll pick up. I just recently spoke to a company that a lot of people have tried to speak with and they haven't spoken with anyone for like, a, I'd say two years or so. And I was able to talk to them. Why? Because I'm part of Ridgewood Investments and we manage a few hundred million dollars. And so that allows me to talk to these companies that most other people aren't able to talk to. And again, when it comes to the bigger companies, you usually don't have access to these management teams. And so for me, that's, that's fun for me. I love talking to them. I love learning from them. I, I learn things that you, don't, you can't read about in the news or in an article. Again, that's just very, very fun for me. And relating back to the jewelry time, when I started that business, I used to go to a lot of trade shows. And I learned so much from every trade show I went to. I mean, I learned about the business by going to a trade show for the first time. And I love doing that with investments as well, too. It's the same, same thing I do. It's, I love going to trade shows because you can talk to company management teams all the time, but until you talk to competitors, suppliers, customers, you really don't get the true picture of the value of a company. Just to set a baseline for people, because we talked about small and micro cap, what does that mean as far as the size of companies and maybe the number of companies, if you know? I mean, I don't think there's a set number, but I like to say micro cap is below, say, 500 million or so. And small cap is below 3 billion in market cap with some inflation. It may, may have got a little bit higher, but those are the numbers that I would pick. And then there's like a nano cap world, which is maybe under two to 300 million, which I think as smaller you go, usually you get much better risk reward opportunities. And how many companies are there to pick from in contrast to say large companies or mid cap companies? It's probably increased quite a bit because in 2020, I think more companies went public like in one year versus the last like 10 years combined or something of that sort. 
But I think the last thing I saw was that in North America, at least, there's around 12,000 publicly listed companies. So I'd say that's probably gone up to like maybe hitting 14, 15,000 or so. That number was from like 2017 that I gave you the 12,000. Yeah, that might not be that high, but I think what you're referring to is also there's a lot of SPACs that are coming out and then they're trying to find private companies and sort of take them public indirectly that way. Yeah, I mean, there's SPACs, a lot of companies are IPOing. Depends on the sector, but there's just so much some froth in certain sectors. So <laughs> that, that companies really want to get that valuation. If you're a private company, if you're a venture back company, you're going public right now, if you can. So you referred to it, you know, we met and obviously you wanted to start a micro cap fund. So why was that? And tell us about the fund and tell us about what your approach to that is now that you're running your own fund. Yeah. So I wanted to start it because for me personally, I would do the same thing if I didn't need to work. So it's just a passion of mine. Like I just see the value there. I know it works. I'm very confident that it works. And it's just a lot of fun for me to do. That in, in combination of just kind of you know, not seeing anything else out there that seemed like a good fit. So if it's not a good fit for something, you might as well just start something yourself. Well, what makes, you know, there are funds out there. So what makes your fund Ridgewood Select Value Fund, what makes it different than all the other funds and what type of investors would find that that fund is the right type of fund for them. So I think what makes us different is the fact that we know we're investing in businesses and we're investing in shares of businesses and a real business. We're not just investing in some, you know, stock ticker and price on a screen and some chart. And so I think what makes us different is the level of due diligence that we do. We want to make sure that every company exists. There's a lot of actually fraudulent companies in the micro cap space, especially And then we want to make sure that we're right in terms of our future outlook and outcome. And so we do this by just doing a lot of legwork and groundwork and getting out there. Like during normal times, we're both traveling a decent amount, you you in particular, and you learn a lot by that. You can learn only so much by sitting behind a screen and learning and reading things. You learn a lot by talking to people, by talking to different people in different industries and understanding what's truly going on in the real world. So one of the books I read during business school that was really influential on me is uh, Howard Marks, The Most Important Thing. And he has a section in there that I found very fascinating. And he was talks about how like news articles, when you read them, you really start thinking, especially if you've ever been involved in something that's been covered by the news, you kind of end up going, that's kind of true, but they're like missing a lot of aspects to it that are quite important or like quite like slant the story in one way versus another. And so for me, when it comes to investing world, like you can read filings, you can watch presentations, you can go even talk to management, but you really get the true story when you're out and talking to customers and all the other parties involved. And so I think that's really like the value that we provide to our funds investors is that we do this work for them that helps skew the risk on investments and to understand truly, hey, like is the outcome we project, is it more likely to happen or is it less likely to happen? And how can we get it to become more likely to happen? Or how can we realize that it's more likely to happen? We can't really be active and sell stuff for companies, but but yeah, I think that's part of the value that we provide. I think the other thing that we initially talked about when we first joined together was how do we charge fees, right? I think one of the big differences is most hedge funds charge a 2% management fee and we don't do that. We think that just because someone has charged 2%, for a long time doesn't make it right necessarily, right? So we don't charge 2%, we charge 1% and we have a founder's class that we don't charge anything to that's gonna be closed up soon. I think that helps make us different as well too. And then also, you know, we're both big investors in the fund. Both of our families have investments in the fund. So we're aligned really, really strongly with our investors. We obviously wanna also share information that's sort of generally applicable. So say there was an aspiring investor or micro cap investor out there, what kind of tips or resources would you point them to that could help them be more successful, even if they wanted to do it themselves? It's a little tough because a lot of the resources I got were from going to business school. And then also after I joined the fund, you kind of start paying for things that become just a lot more convenient there's just so much to investing and it's, it's tough. Like, so there's certain books that I can recommend to read when it comes to data, like just go to SEC, the SEC website, you can get filings from there. That's a great thing to read. There's a lot of YouTube videos. So there's a few things that I think are important for investing, especially in the micro cap world. It's important to understand accounting. When you read the filings and you read the financial statements, 
there's so many things in there that could cause a great business to still not have good value. There's a few like community, I, I can't remember what it was, but I learned so much about accounting from a community college professor that posted YouTube videos. And that was really, really helpful in understanding things like if a company like an engineering firm, for instance, maybe have huge projects that are a few years old, they do something called project accounting. There's a lot of estimates in project accounting. One of the things that I ask management teams when I dig deep into a company is how do you make these estimates? How do you adjust the estimates? You know, how often do you do so? Like walk me through, for an example, on one of your projects, how you would make an estimate as to when you, how you recognize revenue. Because in those instances, they don't necessarily recognize revenue when the cash comes in or like it's kind of random how they recognize revenue. It's like a percent of completion method. And so they decide, okay, well, how much more complete does this project become during this quarter or during this year? And it's all based off of those estimates. It's not based at all as to how much they bill or based off of how much cash they receive. So there's certain things like that that are, I think, quite important to understand. And especially in, in the microcap space, because that's where you can uncover a lot of aggressive management teams or frauds. But even more simple than that, I would read transcripts from companies. I think that's a great source. You can go to ldmicro.com is a great resource to be able to get a lot of this information like the SEC filings and other basic stats on a lot of companies, a lot of microcap companies out there. But what's interesting about microcap is that there's so many different ways to invest in it. Like you can be a story person where it's about the story of the stock. You can be a valuation person where you're just trying to find cheap valuations of companies. And I think ideally you end up being a mixture of both or both matter. And so, yeah, I think that's, those resources are good ways to start and to start looking at things. I mean, I could recommend some books maybe that are helpful. That would be good to kind of help shape invest in frameworks. Really, it just comes down to those like basic things. And then there's also conferences that we attend to that I think is great that are opening up more and more to individuals to be able to like find and like see company presentations and even have meetings with companies as well too. Yeah. And in fact, since you mentioned conferences, obviously we both know Chris Lahiji. You mentioned him earlier in the podcast. You have a unique relationship with Chris. So talk about LD Micro, your, what your involvement with that was. Talk a little bit about your relationship with Chris. And obviously we met at LD Micro the first time ever as well. So Chris is, he says I'm his best friend, but he's one of my few good friends. I'd say. We've known each other from high school. The way we met is actually we were on the tennis team together and we both came in as freshmen and we were both kind of like the one, two new freshman kids that were like battling to see who's going to be the best freshman incoming student. And I remember playing against them and shamefully, he actually whooped me up that day. <laughs> and so he, he is the better tennis player of us. But yeah, so that's how we met and we kind of stayed in touch. He's one of my very good close friends from high school now. And he went into finance and got just kind of stuck with it just his whole life. He ended up starting LD Micro, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so. I can't remember actually how long it's been. <laughs> and so he started having these conferences. I think the conference was 10 years old. And I helped him with the first one a little bit, um, not too much. And, you know, a few of the years, especially just prior to business school, I think the first like two years or so, I helped him quite a bit in terms of getting it started and kind of getting it from one level to the next. Again, I didn't spend too much time, maybe like a week of my life, like each year, helping him out with organizing and getting the conference more on the operation side, set up well. And then, yeah, it's kind of grown from there. Like he helped me get my internship at the fund that was at. He had the relationship there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really the big thing. And so now I sit on the, at the table at a lot of investor meetings at his conferences and I give him like feedback, you know, as a true loyal person who has his best intentions at heart. And I try to be as straight as possible with him and tell him what I like and what I dislike about the conference. And he recently just sold his conference business as well too. And so now he's a board member at a public company. But yeah, I mean, that my relationship is like very close with him. I probably see him like once a month or once every two months in person. We have dinner or spend a day together. One thing we do usually every year more recently is we go to CES in Las Vegas, that trade show together. We'll fly in, hang out that day and go around and go through the whole convention, walk a lot, see a lot of people, have a lot of meetings and then come back that evening. I don't have that relationship with many people. And so he's one of them. He's at the end of the day, he's one of the nicest, like most generous people I've ever met in my life. And those are the type of people I love to have as good friends. And so he's definitely one of them. That's great. And for your fund, what type of investors are you looking for as far as whatever the criteria would be a good fit for the fund? The best fit 
historically for me in terms of this investment style has been people who have their own businesses or at one point have had their own businesses and they understand that there's real value in owning a business, being an owner of a business. And they also understand that you can't judge the value of a business over a quarter or even a year. It's over longer periods of times that you can really extract value out of businesses and you can really grow a lot of value and wealth out of it as well too. So it's a passive way to grow your wealth. And so I usually find people who understand that and understand valuation are the ones who are the best fit, who understand it's for the long term. At times where things are bad in the microcap space, the whole sector is probably usually worse. I'd say in uh, during the COVID times, the performance of the fund didn't do as well and was a lot more volatile and down a lot more than the rest of the markets. But that's because the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. And so our investors, the best investors understand that. And they're not panicking during those times and understand that you know most of our investments are in solid businesses that'll make it through to the other side and it'll end up being better on the other side. I think it's more the best investors are the people who have money saved up and they're able to withstand that type of short-term volatility in their temporary net worth. And if somebody is a long-term oriented investor and they do have enough money, what percentage would you say would be appropriate to put into something like a micro cap type of a fund? I think you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> I think uh, for me personally, because this is something I, I'm very confident in, I would probably say a higher percentage than what, what they act in reality should have. Personally, for me, I'm very, very overweight <laughs> in small and micro cap fund, in the small and micro cap fund in terms of my own personal investments. But I don't know, you probably have a better sense. Know, maybe, I think it depends on the level of wealth, I think matters because then there's two things. I think I don't like to look at it as a percentage. I'd say I'd look at it more as like someone's behavior or mentality or risk aversion, or I wouldn't say risk aversion, but more volatility aversion. Not many people could stomach the volatility that Bitcoin has been doing recently. And there's other people, which I assume like yourself, who doesn't really even look at it every day, <laughs> who owns some Bitcoin. And so I think someone who can stomach the volatility, I think is someone who can put a higher percentage of their net worth, let's say in micro cap. But I don't know, maybe like 15, 20% or so. <laughs> With the idea that obviously the reason to stomach the volatility if you can is that presumably over time you get rewarded for it. Yeah. But I mean, there definitely is some stuff that has volatility that over time ends up worth nothing. The interesting thing, like a lot of like theoretical finance sees volatility as risk. I kind of look at it a little differently. I look at price as risk. If something has gone up in value and the fundamentals haven't changed, to me, that becomes more risky. And so if something's gone down in value and there's like certain assets behind it, to me, that's not that risky. So even if it just goes down really quickly or if it goes down over a slow period of time, that doesn't matter to me. Like the assets are the assets. Yeah, I think what you meant is if the price goes down, then the value is not going to go down as much. So therefore it got less risky. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I think a lot like that as well. So that's great. Thank you for the information on that. And obviously, if somebody wants to get in touch with you or wants some of your recommendations on books or things, how would they contact you? What's the best way? Yeah, they can email me at sam at ridgewoodinvestments.com. You could follow me on Twitter. S. Namiri is my handle. And yeah, I think that's probably the two best ways to get a hold of me. Just to kind of close out the interview, I'd like to ask everybody um, to share sort of what person or experience. It could be one or it could be more than one. It could be a book or something that had the greatest role in shaping the person you've become. My wife would probably be upset and she is upset that I read this book, but there's a book called The Game and it's about pickup artists and how to pick up on girls. And that book, I read it when I had the jewelry company and that really influenced me. And not at all because, you know, I was actually in a serious relationship with my now wife at the time. But it was more that it really taught me that humans are wired a certain way and that you can take advantage of it if, if you need to be, or you can play a certain game, which is why it's called the game, where you can put the odds in your favor. When I read that, that book really changed my mind in terms of understanding that humans are wired in a way, and it's really never going to change. So I think that that's shaped me quite a bit in a combination of the jewelry company also like myself, like understanding, hey, I have these certain biases myself and sometimes you catch them and sometimes you don't. And then figuring out processes that make you be able to function better to avoid those biases. But that again, just that book itself 
And then I had friends, we would just kind of play games and see like, hey, like this certain things, do certain things work, do certain things not work. Same thing that happened with the jewelry company. It's like you put out a marketing, you start marketing a certain way. Does it work? Does it not work? And you realize that certain things consistently work, even if people know that they're being played. That's the thing. Like even when people know they're being played, you can almost turn it in a certain way where it still works. <laughs> um, so like there's certain things there. Again, that book had its own strategies and some of them are like borderline sketchy or not morally as correct. But again, that book just like changed the way I thought about like human psychology and how propaganda can be done. I think I read somewhere that propaganda historically was actually a positive term back when that term was made. And it was made by, I think Ford came up with that term when they were mass marketing initially. It really is about like, how do you grab people's innate instincts and kind of have them do what they actually want to do from internally instead of trying to convince somebody to do something. It's a very different way of, I guess, like marketing or negotiating with someone. So that, that book was really a big one for me. I'd say another one was Sapiens, which is kind of a similar realm in terms of understanding human behavior and psychology. Well, Sam, thanks for a fascinating discussion. We really appreciated uh, having you here and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk again. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to fly and see each other soon. Yeah. <laughs> Take care, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Sam Namiri. Some of my biggest takeaways from our conversation included the Zoroastrian principle of good thoughts, good words, and good deeds, the importance of getting people to feel more comfortable before having a conversation about business, the challenges that he experienced managing people as an entrepreneur, and the contrast between being an entrepreneur in an operating business versus being a fund manager in an investment-oriented business. I was also struck by Sam's insights on why microcap investing is such an attractive place to look for opportunities and generate higher returns. Thank you for listening to this episode of Compound Ideas, hosted by Ken Majmidar of Ridgewood Investments. Connect with Ken, learn more about the show, and never miss an episode at compoundideashow.com. Ken Majmidar is the founder of Ridgewood Investments and several other affiliated companies. All opinions expressed by Ken and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Ridgewood Investments or any of its affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as basis for investment decisions. Clients of Ridgewood Investments and its affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast.